Operation Confidence proudly presents America's Invisible Heroes Radio Talk Show. Tune in weekly on Sundays from 2 to 3.30 p.m. Pacific Time with your host, Consuela Mackey, co-host, U.S. Air Force veteran, Matt Davidson, announcers, Taylor Marcella and Brooke Gadesi, U.S. Army veteran and entertainment host, Charles Whitehead, U.S. Army Special Forces veteran, and I once was whole segment host, Richard Cook. U.S. Army veteran and lifeline for women's veterans segment host, Martha Elena Varela. National Faith Program director and veterans in recovery segment host, Anthony Akimpora. And U.S. Air Force veteran and incarceration to success segment host, Kevin Lewandowski. For more information or to be a guest on our show, email info at operationconfidence.org. Operation Confidence is a grassroots nonprofit. The organization's mission is to provide stable housing for veterans who have experienced homelessness, as well as providing a wide range of supportive services. To help accomplish our goal, a successful landowner has donated land for the project, a world-renowned architect has offered to design the houses, and construction classes from the local community colleges will take part in building the houses. Your support and donations are needed. To get involved, please visit our website at www.operationconfidence.org or email info at operationconfidence.com. Well, welcome everyone, and thank you for tuning in to America's Invisible Heroes, a show dedicated to our American heroes, especially those who are disabled and have experienced some type of homelessness. Well, I'm your host, Consuela Mackey, Executive Director of a grassroots nonprofit organization called Operation Confidence. No, I'm not a vet. But my heart goes out to our American heroes, especially those who are disabled and may have experienced homelessness. For those who are new to the show, American Invisible Heroes strives to, has actually been established to provide a platform for our veterans to be able to share their stories, heartfelt stories, resources, challenges, and accomplishments. Now, allow me to introduce you to our co hosts. We have Air Force veteran Matt Davidson. He's a board member. We have U.S. Army Reserve veteran Charles Whitehead, also a board member. We have Taylor Marcella. He's a board member, one of our announcers. And U.S. Army veteran Martha Varela. She's an advisory board member, and she has a weekly segment called Lifeline to Women Veterans. We have Dorsey Dijon. She has a monthly segment. She by month, excuse me, and she has this segment called Make Music LA. And then we have Ann Monique. She also has a bi monthly segment, and hers is the Rosie's Movement. Richard Cook, he's a U.S. Special Forces veteran. He has a bi monthly segment called I Once Was Old. Say hello to everyone and please wave so they'll know who you are. Richard. Hello, hello. Okay. We have one of our segment hosts, Dr. Kathy Cash. She's also a U.S. Army veteran, and she has a bi-monthly segment called Strategies for Hope. She's going to give us this amazing prayer that we really, really need at this time. Kathy? Amen. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. To God be the glory. We know that we are on this Memorial Day weekend. And this is the time when we remember those soldiers, those airmen, and all of the service members who died in service to this country. Uh, the difference between Memorial Day and Veterans Day, we are observing and observing the living service members on Veterans Day. And on tomorrow and throughout the weekend, we've been uh, commemorating the lives of those veterans who passed on in service to our country. Tomorrow at 3 p.m. local time, wherever you are at 3 p.m., somewhere you should be hearing taps. Because 3 p.m. local time is a time that has been nationally established at the time, the moment you set aside to remember. In, the, in between your bites of barbecue, your hot dog, your hamburger, take a moment and just remember the reason for this holiday. So if you go with me in prayer, 
Shall we bow? Heavenly Father, how we say thank you for just the blessings of this day. We thank you for all that you have done, all that you are doing, and all that you are going to do in all of our lives, and especially in the lives of our veterans. Lord, we thank you for this platform that shares all that is to know about veterans. So Lord, we are endeavoring to share this information so that people know who veterans are, what they've done, and we can take away the fact that they are our nation's invisible heroes. Lord, we thank you for the men and women who stood in that classroom with the flag and raised their hand and pledged their life for this country. Lord, we thank you. And then Lord, this Memorial Day has a, another significance, another special piece because we've been listening to all of the shootings that have gone on throughout our country. In just the first five months of this year, over 250 shootings, mass shootings have happened. And that's more than three or four people per incident. And so Lord, we know that we are a nation that is in need of prayer. Your word tells us that we're to love one another, love God and then love each other as ourselves. And as we begin to implement that love, we can not only, we will not only show love one to another, we will not only build each other up, we will build our nation up. We will bring the understanding and recognition of what needs to happen for us to continue as a nation. Lord, we were founded upon your principles. We were founded upon your word. And we just thank you for being a loving God in the midst of all of this. We thank you for forgiveness of our sins for in everything that's going on, we still have sinned and fallen short of your glory. But we thank you, Lord. And we lift all of those up to you who are in mourning. For you told us in your word that you will comfort those who are so as we move into this Memorial Day holiday, we just ask that you allow us to remember the loved ones, the service members, the families of those who gave their lives for this country. And then Lord, as we continue to move in our efforts to recognize all of our nation's heroes, we just thank you for the platforms that you've given us such as this. We thank you for the hearts and minds of the people who are here. You don't have to be a veteran to wanna to support and serve a veteran. Well, we thank you, Lord, for all those who are here. And we ask that you continue to keep us individually and collectively. But we're moving forward to show this love that you have given to us. And we're showing it one to another. In your name, we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you so much. We want to say, say a special prayer for the many that were killed in the supermarket and the children recently killed the other day. So thank you so much, Amen. Dr. Cash. You were so Amen. wonderful. We're very grateful that you had a time to come on. I know you're very busy, but thank you so much for coming on and saying that wonderful prayer. We need it. Amen. God bless you all. Okay. I'll see you all soon. Okay, thank you. Okay, Matt, my dear, dear friend, Matt, U.S. Army Air Force veteran, Matt, Matt Davis. Right. Uh I just want to uh, say thanks also for that beautiful prayer that was wonderfully said and it was important to be said. And I'm so grateful that uh, our yes, guest well. was able to do that for us. Yes. Um, there's a saying in the military, all gave some, some gave all. And that's what tomorrow is all about is those who gave all and uh, they are in our prayers always and uh, for those who may not know it tonight uh, at 5 p.m pacific standard time on pbs television there is a national memorial day concert this features gary sinise and Joe Montaigne, and it's it's a perfect, perfect time to get together to watch, to be inspired by those who served and uh, gave gave everything for this country. So you may want to keep that in mind if you have time, five o'clock this evening. Uh, just tune in to your local PBS television station and you can watch this uh, Memorial Day concert. Also, uh, Vietnam Veterans Memorial Fund, 
uh, Fund is having a tribute tomorrow, Memorial Day, and they will be broadcasting a video of the event. And uh, if you would like to watch that, you, you may. Uh, uh, all you need to do is to go into HTTPS colon slash slash www.bvmf.org slash live. And you can watch their ceremony, which is also from Washington, D.C. And that's tomorrow. Can you and repeat that, Matt? Yes. I knew you were going to say that. <laughs> <laughs> it is H T T P S colon slash slash www.vvmf.org slash live. And that's the uh, Vietnam Veterans Memorial in Washington, D.C. Okay. And what, uh, what time at? I'm not sure the time on that. Okay. Uh, they don't have it listed here. Oh, wait a second. Yes, they do. Uh, Monday, May 30th at 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, which should be what, at 10, 10 a.m. our time, I guess, here in the West. Um, but those are the two announcements that I have. Mm -hmm. uh, a while ago, I wrote a poem and I read it on air here for the first time. And uh, I would like to repeat the reading of this poem because it ties into Memorial Day, I think. And, yes, uh, please do. Yeah, it is called he is in the wind. I don't recall the moment that it happened. I only know that one minute I was in an intense firefight. And in a flash, I was hovering over the noise and the chaos. Later, I watched disconnected as a steel casket draped, draped with an American flag was loaded on board the transport aircraft. I knew I was not in that casket and that I needed to be home with her. I needed her to know that I was okay, that there was no pain and that I was at peace. I couldn't wipe away her tears as she cried out my name. And at the funeral, my hand softly touched up against her hair in the wind. And as she was presented the flag, she fixed her eyes upon the ground. And I wanted to tell her not to be sad. I wanted her to know I would never leave her. I wanted her to know that there is no death and that the spirit lives internal in the wind and in the beauty of nature. On the day she went to the wall, I went with her she left a letter near my panel. It was a beautiful tribute to what we once was ours. It was supposed to rain that day, but the sun shone and it was a glorious day. As she was leaving the wall, I whispered, I love you. She turned, faced the wall one last time. And then she walked away with the wind at her back. And that is the oh, story of he is so touching. So touching. Uh, can you uh, tell us a little bit about where these beautiful poems and uh, are being uh, read? I think that you're in some of the veteran magazines as well. Yeah, the, most of these are in uh, Veteran Voices magazine. And this is a magazine where veterans are encouraged to write and now do artwork for the mm -hmm. magazine. And uh, these magazines, after they are printed, are sent to VA hospitals throughout the country. And so all veterans can take part. 
Yeah, we had the executive director on the show at one time, wasn't it? That's right. That's Margaret Clark. She is yes. the actually editor in chief. Oh, okay. We have to have her to come on again. She was fabulous. Please yes. invite her. Okay. Yes. yes. Thank you so much. You're welcome. And, That's uh, my map. We go back many years, don't we, Matt? Oh, we do. We and do. I'm so and, honored to have you on the show. And, and I am I'm so grateful that we just remain together, good friends always. Yes. There for have. one another. That's right. That's right. In support of our veterans. <laughs> okay. Well, we're moving right along. We have Ann coming up next. Taylor, you going to tell us a little bit? I'm sorry. Before Ann comes on, we have to do our little bit with Martha regarding women and on Memorial Day as well. I'm remembering our women who served. You got it, honey. In some ways, women were responsible for starting Memorial Day. The holiday's beginnings date back to 1866 when women in both the Union and South began placing flowers on graves of the fallen from the Civil War. As Parade Magazine reports, one of the first decoration days, as it's sometimes called, took place in a Southern cemetery. And when the women placing flowers saw the neglected graves of the Union soldiers, soldiers they made it a point to place flowers on their graves too. It was the first of many acts that would start healing that terrible wound. Women veterans are the fastest growing segment of the veteran population and have been serving in the armed forces since the Civil War. With Memorial Day tomorrow, it's only right to recognize women who dedicated their lives to serving their country, some of them making the ultimate sacrifice. Women played a large role in military service dating back to the days before they were allowed to formally serve. The Women in Military Service for American Memorial Foundation provides an educational timeline showing that women served on the battlefield during the war as nurses, water bearers, cooks, laundresses, and sabotagers beginning with the American Revolution. Beginning in 1948, Congress passed the Women's Armed Services Integration Act granting women permanent status in the military and entitlement to veteran benefits. According to the Pentagon's count in 2013, there were more than 200,000 women in the active duty military. And last December, U.S. Defense Secretary Ashton Carter announced that beginning this year, all combat jobs will be open to women, opening another 220,000 more jobs to women that were previously only available to men including, and this includes jobs as Army Rangers, Green Berets, Navy SEALs, and in the Marine Corps. As women's involvement in the military expanded, even more women have put themselves in the path of danger in their service to their country. Of the approximate 400,000 U.S. women who have served with the armed forces during World War II, as many as 543 died in war-related incidents, including 16 from enemy fire and 38 brave women's Air Force service pilots who perished during World War II, during the Second World War. But tomorrow, May 30th, while we honor these women whose service was recorded, we will also remember the countless other women who were unable to serve in any official capacity, but who still volunteered for civilian service and put themselves at risk. Women who served as spies or cared for soldiers or served in any way they could including distinguished disguising themselves as men to fight and die for their country. This uh, article was is in the Homeland Magazine, March 2019, um, section for Women's History Month. Thank you, Connie, for sharing that. I, by you being uh, an Army veteran, we are very thankful that you were able to give that presentation. Do you have any feedback? I do. I think it was interesting to see um, you know, how many women have been, you know, for how long women have been uh, serving in some kind of way, whether even dressing as men and disguising themselves as men to serve. So that, that was right. kind of an interesting note that I, I guess I really never knew before, but just even with like the Rosies, you know, we, we is a prime example of how um, right. they may not have been soldiers per se, because they weren't allowed, or again, the men went off to war, but how instrumental the women were in making sure that the home front jobs and all that kept going so it's it's 
a great article, I think, that highlights, you know, the service that women have have um, given. And again, honoring those who gave their the ultimate sacrifice um, on Memorial Day. So, yeah, Thank I thought you. this was a nice article, Connie. It must Thank not you for... have been too organized back then because uh, it's kind of hard to disguise yourself as a man, <laughs> you know, going through like, you know, the, the things you go through for basic and all of that nowadays, you know, so I say. I guess things have really uh, changed since then. So, but it's good right. that women are, you know, they've always been there and always been part of it. You know, we we, we don't uh, get to thank them enough, and so that's a great thing. Well, it's a perfect tie-in for Anne. Thank you, Martha. Thank Taylor, you I want you to pre Thanks present so Anne and her guests, please. Uh, before I introduce Paul, let me comment, uh, Martha. We have a member of our board who is. Uh, a woman, uh, American historian professor, who has mm -hmm. researched women in the Civil War. It's fascinating. And there were babies born on the, the battlefield. Wow. That we should get her as a guest someday. Oh, oh please yeah, do. Yeah, for That's... sure. Now, it's my pleasure to introduce, uh, introduce Paul Sarkissian. Paul. Can you take your hand down for me, please? Oh, yes. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. There you uh, go. Paul was, um, and the, I first met Paul in Philadelphia at a gathering of Rosie the Riveters. And uh, there was maybe, I would say, seven or so Rosies there that day in a, a upscale residential care facility. And um, I immediately related to his grandmother, who was Rose. And to Paul, because I saw the bond between Paul and his grandmother um, as an Appalachian, maybe maybe that's not relevant, but I grew up in a culture where we had our mammals and papals and our extended families and all that. And we never let go of them. Uh, it's uh, very much family oriented. So he won my heart from the very beginning. And then I found that he's quite the professional and he's also somebody who goes in and out of Armenia because his grandmother's family escaped the Armenian genocide. So when the Christians were killed, um, I'm not sure the year, you'll have to help me on that, Paul, maybe 1918, something like that. Yeah, 1915 and during the World War I yeah. times. Okay, and, um, and really quite a horrifying story that I had not known. So it's my pleasure to introduce Paul, who's going to tell us about his grandmother, Rose. Thank you very much for introducing me, Anne, and for everyone here for having me and Consuela. Uh, so thank you. Um, we, as Anne mentioned, uh, she's always said that my grandmother's story was a bit different than some of the other Rosie stories that she has because my grandmother's family were immigrants. So like she said, there, there, there was a, a strong family connection and, and bond amongst them because really these people uh, escaped with nothing and coming to the... Oh, I knew I'd be interrupted. We have a little... Uh, so yeah, I knew that was going to happen. That's my nephew. Uh, you know, he, no one was talking to me for the past 20 minutes and then suddenly when it's time for me to talk. So that's the way it always goes. It happens but, all the time on the news and everything else. Yeah, <laughs> that's oh, right. There's some funny videos about that. Uh, <laughs> but, what, but what I was saying was that... Um, they, they lost their whole families in these killings and the ones that were able to escape uh, came to America or got separated to different countries. And so when they uh, came here, they found whatever um, family members they had left that had escaped or even just people that weren't related, but they were Armenian, they had that connection and they made new communities here. They founded churches. That was the first thing they did when they came here. They had to make churches because that was their spiritual connection. And it, and it was also like a community connection for them. So everyone could be gathered around the church. Um, but so that's my, my grandmother was born in America, just 
a year after her parents came here. Her father had been here before, but went back because he had a, a family over there and he wanted to fight to save them. Uh, but he unfortunately was never able to find them and, and lost them. And so he married again and then had my grandmother and her sister. Uh, so um, what when they were growing up, she remembered being uh, looked down on because they were immigrants and they were called foreigners by the people in their town and kind of made fun of, you know, the parents didn't speak English well and all these different reasons. Uh, so she always remembered that. And that was a, a thing that uh, kept, you know, that she talked about even in, in her last years, because you don't forget that kind of thing. And, 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 but she also remembers, you know, back then with, you know, the, the racial issues too. She talked about, you know, they didn't, okay, <laughs> you have fun. <laughs> uh, she moved to Philadelphia from a, a small town up in Massachusetts when she was about 10 because of the uh, great depression. And so they came down here and that was, the first time she ever saw African Americans and she remembered people, you know, calling them bad names in the street and, and things like that. And that was a real big shock for her because there weren't, you know, anybody like that up where she came from. She was the one on the bottom in her town because there was just these white people that were, you know, their great, 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 great grandparents came. And so then when she got to Philadelphia, it was a whole different environment. And that was another thing that she talked about. And we know how that wasn't right. When she was a kid, she didn't, she was 10, she didn't really know what was going on, but as she got older and realized, you know, what was going on. So those, these are the types of things I learned from her about, about what life was like back then. And then when the war started, her, her mother had died a few years before and she had wanted to go become, go to college. And, but that was a difficult thing for people that didn't have, you know, a lot of money and a lot of connections and, and with her mother dying, she had to take care of, help take care of the family instead of, you know, going off to college. So that was a regret she had. But then when the war started, she had graduated from high school not long before, and she saw people recruiting uh, for working in these factories like the Rosies did. And so she uh, signed up for it and she said it was six or even seven days a week. She would just work. But you know, it was, it was both a thing for the country because she always said she thought of all the men that were abroad fighting and, you know, whatever she did, it, it was nothing compared to what they did. But to the same degree, she would kind of put it down at times and not really think it was important. And Anne uh, came along with her Rosie's group in the later years uh, and what helped instill in her uh, that what she gave to the country was very important and, and how necessary it was that we had people working on the home front and, and doing that kind of work. And so uh, Anne's organization really helped with, I mean, with so many Rosies that they reach out, that it reaches out to and, and has them, you know, give talks and, and has really done very important things in their lives. But it also helps them, I think, as women at a time when women couldn't really accomplish, they weren't allowed to accomplish as much as, as today. It, it, it really helps these women to understand their importance. So if you have any questions or anything, or if Anne has anything to say, I don't wanna just keep going. So I, I think I'll turn it over. All right, well, that's your grandma, huh? She's oh so yeah, this beautiful. was at, at an event in Washington, DC uh, last year. Uh, that Anne was at as well. And, and I got to speak just a little bit about, about what uh, she meant to me and, and the legacy. So this was around the time that she was working in the factories. And, and she said, I mean, it was, it was a really dirty, uh, loud, kind of scary environment at times uh, with these big machines. And they'd ask her to work on some of these really big ones that only men were working on. And she just did it because that's that's what she had to do and and she you know she ended up being able to do it for a time and um and you know the, but the but the men there the one the men that were there she said they were overall nice you know she never had any issues or anything like that it wasn't wasn't you know it was, it was an overall you know a, a I don't know a nice time but it was a you know it was, she she always talked about it fondly and 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 her 
for you know what she did there and then that she helped the country during that time but they never let they never told her what she was doing actually she was grinding down pieces of glass and and you know maybe that was used for sightseeing of different weapons or something but we really she was not allowed to know because it was so top secret during the war that they didn't even tell them what they were doing so i think that's always an interesting fact that you know even though they were making these parts they were not allowed to know fully what they were doing and they weren't allowed to tell anyone about if they were working in the factory or anything like that so that's another reason why it kind of got forgotten over the years because if you weren't allowed to talk about it well you know it's just okay then you get on with your life afterwards you just keep moving on but it wasn't a thing that we really recognized for a long time wow that is so precious. Uh, we, I commend you on, on the closeness that you had with your grandma. What are the special times that you had with her? Oh, well, one of the, well, I, I think, you know, from the time I was young, we'd go over every Saturday to her house and spend time with her. And my grandfather, when he was alive, he had been uh, in World War II. So we'd hear his stories from fighting in World War II. And uh, he was in Japan and in the Philippines. Uh, and then with her, you know, from when I was really little, she she would do laundry and I would sit up as like a two year old or something on the on the washing machine. And then she, you know, show me how to do things and she'd put things out on the lawn, the, the line of the laundry and I'd run through the sheets and you know, things like <laughs> oh, that's that. So fun. <laughs> those are those, those are really nice memories from when I was very young. And then right. in in 2017, uh, through Anne's organization, she got honored at the Liberty Bell. And so that was a great experience for oh, us. Wow. That the mayor of Philadelphia was there and some other Rosies and they were treated like they were famous, you know, there's all these people taking they were? photos. Oh. And it was yeah, a it was a just... really, really fun experience. You don't have a photo of that, do you? I do have some photos. I guess not not available at the moment, but we do have some photos. It was in the newspaper even. The Philadelphia Inquirer took a photo of them and put that in the newspaper. So I do have some photos from that day. Well, you have to share that with come back and share them with us. Because the road yeah, we'll is very that. important to us. We've had we haven't had the pleasure of having your grandma on, but we have had some roses on and their minds is just amazing how they can remember from everything that happened at that time and up until today. And here we have a problem just remembering what happened an hour ago. Oh yeah, I I I I, I agree. <laughs> it's <laughs> I don't know how they could remember in such oh detail goodness. over all that time. Yeah. Oh, that is so precious. Well, uh, if you will, tell a little bit about uh, Rosa's last um, days. I think it's pretty important to point out that we lost an awful lot of Rosies through COVID, but oh, also yeah. the national media picked up on her story when we finally got it out to That's right. a couple of newspapers, and then there was yes, a chain reaction. Why don't you tell about that? How long has she been gone? And at uh, what it's age? been a year and a half almost. Uh, so it was at the end of 2020. So she had gone through, she she lived al alone up until uh, the last year when she couldn't really do it anymore. And she moved into uh, a, a residential place for uh, older people. But then COVID started right after that. So then oh, she was wow. locked in there all the time for months. And you know, that was really a hard time for everybody. And we could talk through this zoom kind of thing every so often but you know it wasn't it wasn't often and it, it was it was difficult but then um and so COVID would go through those places very badly and she yeah. was stuck in there we couldn't get her out what we could what could we do she didn't know what to do and you know how would anyone so we, it, it was a really difficult time but then um even just a couple of weeks before she died uh, uh Anne had a uh talk with some Rosies at the Rosette Riveter Trust. They had a Zoom like this and she uh, gave, talked a little bit about her life and it's on YouTube uh, even. And so that was just days before she came down with the COVID. And so she, even in her very last days really was talking about her experiences. And uh, so yes, she got that and, and she was in the hospital for a bit and she was okay. It was, you know, but then I don't, I think at that age, when you're that right. old and you have something like that, it just, 
even yeah. though it might not even um, been it was because of it i think the covid just messes things up and just you know so she so she passed away and uh we put a big obituary in the newspaper because she always liked reading obituaries and about people's lives and and so you you know we she would have wanted to have a nice thing written about her and and the the newspaper did a little article about it too and and gave a, a, a gave some quotes about her life in it and then about a, a month after that um the msnbc one one of their shows called uh i think deadline white house uh with nicole wallace on msnbc they they had been doing stories on people that uh, died due to covid and they came across this obituary themselves i didn't send it anywhere i didn't i thought that was it and they ended up contacting me and, and asking for a lot of pictures and everything about her and, and they did a really nice segment on her life and so she never would have imagined getting to be on national tv like wow, that i mean she, that's amazing so it was really really something that it that i mean you know i wish she could have seen it because she would have never would have believed it but yeah so that was a really really nice thing and it, and it helped all of us you know getting to see that because right. it means her life is being remembered and that it's you know really had a, a big impact that is so precious. Can you come back or have Anne to show that? We would love to see that. Can you come back and show Yeah, it? that's online too. So uh, we can send you all this stuff so okay. uh, you can- And, you and can you'll, you'll present that, right? Yes, I will. The other okay, thing you right. might wanna know is that um, one of our roses that you know, June Robbins, got mm -hmm. a high school diploma, an actual high mm -hmm. school diploma at age 94. And Paul oh, was one of the speakers to help present that to her. In oh, that would be recently. that would be amazing. So show to me, all. Paul is a really a wonderful example of what the families of the Rosies can and should do. Exactly, and doing a beautiful job. Oh, oh well, Paul, you you're very special, Paul. We want to want to show more about your wonderful, wonderful grandma. And yeah. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I'm, and I'm always willing to come around again too if 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 it oh, if it please. works. Out. So, please How old do. Was she was she was about to turn ninety six, so okay. she was just a couple of days away from it. So she was, you know, quite up there yeah. in age. Wow! Thank you for What's sharing. Yeah. Uh, one more thing: Can you describe her sweet smile? <laughs> oh, the, that that you know, it's funny how you mentioned that because. I think as sometimes as family members, you get so used to it that you don't even notice it or, but when she, but when after she died, so many people commented on her smile, it was a thing that it really made us go like, oh, wow, that really made a impact on people because so many people talked about it. And, and uh, I, the picture we used in the obituary really captures her smile. It was from the uh, Liberty Bell event. Uh, for the Rosies, and she was just so happy to be there and to have the mayor recognize her, and so she's smiling very much for it. And so it was a really nice photo to to use, and and, and just so many people commented on on that on her smile. So it really made us go, oh wow, yeah, because I think too, you know, in the last years, it was a harder time for her with you know a lot of the pains and getting older and the different problems that would come up so maybe we didn't hadn't seen her smiling as much but then the people that had known her for years that's the first thing that they thought of and so it kind of reminded us like oh wow yeah so yeah. It, that that really it, it's really interesting when somebody dies and and you hear what people say about them and sometimes you hadn't even thought about that or realized that and they really point things out to you and so uh so that Anne noticed it everyone noticed it it's really something yeah it's so precious nice. well thank you so much for sharing that her story she sounds like an amazing person wish we oh. could have had her on the show hi Anne. Yeah. But we i know i wish there was more i could have done with her in those times that we had her and she was on a few things but not you know there's always so much more that that could have been done but then it was so hard the last year or two being yeah she's in the in the in the home and we can't even get in there it was yeah. it was tough but i remember I'm, hearing about that on tv how the different uh homes were treating the elderly so i do understand but 
At least but there was a YouTube video of her talking, so we'll send that too, so you yeah. can see a little bit of what it would have been like if she was on the show. Oh yeah, please do, and I would love for you to present that on the show. I, okay, I'd, I'd be more than happy to. Sooner the better. Thank you so much, okay. and thank you, Paul. Thank you, Paul. And Paul, I'll be talking to you in a week or so here about some other things. Great. Thank you, everyone, for having me and giving me the chance. And to you're talk welcome about to stay it. if you want. Okay. But, uh, my family's okay. having dinner. That's why my nephew came up because they're starting to have dinner. So I'm going to, I'll leave it on, but I'm going to run over to, <laughs> to oh, dinner yeah. downstairs. Right. <laughs> okay. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. We're going to turn it over to you, Matt. We know you have to leave soon as well. Yeah. You I, read your poem. I did that. No, you had another part that you were going to show, uh, talk about today, weren't you? Well, I talked about the uh, shows, Memorial Day shows that are going to be on tonight and tomorrow night. And then I read the poem that I dedicated to Memorial Day. I guess we just didn't get enough of you. <laughs> 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 we want to get catch you while we got you. He's uh, Matt's only able to come on once a month, so we, <laughs> we understand he's very busy. But... Uh, we really thank you so much, man. Oh, by the way, when is your book coming out? The book has gotten through the writing, the editing, the design, proofreading, mm -hmm. and now it's going into the publication part. Oh, okay. And, so, and to me, that's like trigonometry or something. I hate to be bothered with that. <laughs> I can, oh, is it confusing? Can write till, Till the cows come home, but I don't like that other part. That right, exactly. It's a mess. <laughs> I can understand. Well, we're well, excited I, to know, read about it, read it, and and help promote it as well. Well, that'd be great. Uh, I would appreciate that. I'll let you know as it moves along. Hopefully, it go quickly, but we'll yeah. see. Yeah. Okay. Thank right. you, Matt. Thank Give you. me my love. I know that you have to go leave now, but. We're always excited to hear hear from you. And Good see thing. you next month for sure. You got it. Okay. <laughs> bye, my friend. Bye-bye. Okay. All right, Charles. We got Darcy. Darcy. Now, see, last time I jacked it up, I think I was at the <laughs> fair. You know? so now, now I need to know what the official real name is so I don't confuse it again. <laughs> it's it's Duchon, right? Dujan, yes. Yeah, I think the last time I said Duhan, I was, you know, giving it the... the, the oh, that happens a lot. That uh, happens you a know, lot. You assume it's, uh, you know, it's uh, that way. So I was under the gun before, but I'm calm. Okay. And now. <laughs> but anyway, uh, Dorsey is the director of Make Music LA, and she's on the planning committee for the Congress of Neighborhood, Local and the Neighborhood Council. She's an advisory, advisory board for Arts for LA. And... Uh, her original research started in December of 2000. Now I'm gonna just let you uh, take it away there, Dorsey. <laughs> well, actually, I think that's really research for Jill Sullivan. And oh, she's okay. the person who wrote this article that I'm gonna read to you. But I also would like to just mention that Make Music LA is coming up on June 21st and registration is open. So we're looking for musicians and we're looking for venues um, and, and outdoor spaces where folks can play. So go to the okay. website, it's makemusicla.org and you'll be able to see a, a lot more about what we're doing. And we're in this healing phase of our country and uh, we all need to take a breath and relax and listen to some music. And um, I think that that's, the, that's the kind of medicine that we need to start our summer in a very mellow way. When but is the dates again, Darcy? It is Tuesday, June 21st. Okay. And uh, it is all over the country, not just here in Los Angeles, Seattle, Washington, right. uh, DC, uh, Boston, Chicago, yes, Austin, Nashville, yeah, Denver. Yeah, it's all it's all over, and it's it's wonderful in every city because everyone does it a little a little bit differently, and there are all kinds of fantastic um, 
programs that go on with that mass appeal events where you'll have maybe 100 guitars playing and and harmonicas where you'll have 50 or 60 harmonica uh, folks playing so it, it's really wonderful so check out makemusicday.org and makemusicla.org That's in the great. coming and you weeks, over that whole big big project huh no, 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 over in Los Angeles. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Just well, you say, let's, let's clarify this right away. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Well, it's, that's a, it's, that's it's actually, huge, though. it's international. It started, oh, right. it, it started in Paris mm -hmm. um, 40 years ago. This is the, the 40th anniversary. And how it right. happened is uh, Jack Lang, who was the, um, he, what was he, the uh, Minister of Culture, and a jazz musician, an American jazz musician, an expat, together decided they wanted to do something different. And so mm -hmm. they took some chairs and put them out on the bridges in Paris. And musicians came, sat down, and started playing. And it's been going on like that every, every year ever since. You wow. can't walk through Paris, drive through Paris. It is wall to wall musicians and people just having a blast. That, so, that sounds great. It is. So, you have to come back with some video on that. Oh, I, oh, I'd love to. That would be great. So we can get an idea. Yeah, where I would love where to. Where it's well, being shown all over, all over Paris and yeah. where else it's being shown. That would be great. It's it, Yeah, we can do that. We can okay. Do that. That's but your since, next assignment. <laughs> yes. Since we're, since we're talking about women, today's conversation is... Uh, was written by a woman, and uh, she's uh, Jill Sullivan. And her interest was in finding out more about military bands, and in particular, women in military bands. So this is what she says. Uh, using historical methods and interviews with 79 women, military musicians, most octogenarians, I discovered that there were eight U.S. military bands and four oh wait a minute wait, I'm, I'm sorry let me do this again <laughs> i discovered that there were eight u.s women's military bands and four drum and bugle corps serving during the era of the war all ensembles were conducted by women six of whom were music teachers before the war Band members brought a variety of music experience and expertise with them into the military. Music degrees, music teaching, professional dance band experience, and school, town, and industry band membership. Most women started their instrumental performing in school bands and supplemented this instruction with private lessons. Women also remembered participating in other school instrumental activities prior to the war, such as rhythm bands, national band contests, solo and ensemble contests, and college bands. In addition to US women's military bands, Canada and England utilized women's bands to serve their female troops. This World War II research led me to find more women's bands that existed long before and after the war. The Women's Air Force Band, the 14th Army Band, the Hormel Girls Drum and Bugle Corps, and 19th and 20th Century Women's Town, Military, Immigrant, and Suffrage Bands. This important scholarly pursuit helps fill gaps in instrumental music history and music education by documenting women's roles as instrumental musicians, music teachers, and conductors for a century in America from 1870 to 1976. And there are still women's military bands going on today. Next time I come, I'll bring uh, a little video of, of some music of some of those bands. But right. like, but they were also segregated. So you had all black bands and you had all white bands. So they got together later on, I think probably in the late 60s and 70s, then they began to um, integrate. Wow. So, you want me to share these pictures? Yes, please. Yeah. You think? I said, when? 
<laughs> no, I don't want to put them up there. She's talking, and then uh, you know. Oh no, that's no, that would have been was fun. Perfect time. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, that would have been great. Well, we can't really see them, oh, but they're yeah, marching in a parade. There we go. That's yeah. a little large. There you go. That's better. Yeah. Where was this, uh, Darcy? I don't know where this was, to be honest. Okay, here but we go. A lot of these photographs don't actually have the locations of where they are, but I mm -hmm. know that some of them, when they're, you know, they're dressed, it's that they're off in, and doing parades. They, that's one of the things that they did was they went and performed for a, a variety of, of civil, um, for civil organizations, and of course, in, in for the military. And most often, they were performing for the troops. Mm -hmm. and, um, yeah, so. Was, wow. Yeah, pretty cool, pretty cool. Yeah, most definitely. <laughs> Great. Well, we look forward to you coming back with uh, Make Music LA going on throughout the United States anyway, or wherever you can show it. Yeah, okay. I'm happy to. <laughs> that would be great. Thank you Thank so you. much, girlfriend. Good to see everybody. Same here. Of that. Make music, LA. I got Dorsey in trouble. <laughs> what did you do <laughs> this time? <laughs> she, she, she wanted me to double book myself for the. We were gonna play for a park in Santa Monica. Yeah, you brought it up before, so that's why I'm gonna just you know mention this little story. <laughs> I got in trouble. Oh, I'm trying to forget it. Yeah. <laughs> got and me in say, trouble. Oh, no. <laughs> They're, not, you know, They're still not really talking good. to me. Are you serious? <laughs> I'm serious. Really? Oh, no. What did you do, Charles? Well, uh, you know, uh, I was willing to, to again. Do it. <laughs> Yeah, see, that's, you know, that's, I'm like Mikey, you know, I do everything. I get, <laughs> see, it's a cross town issue because yeah, he so. had to have gone from Santa Monica to downtown. And unless you're in a helicopter in the middle of <laughs> yeah, the afternoon, the it's not going to happen. And what did you do? Well, I had already committed to Santa Monica, and then Dorsey was like, you know, can you play for the, was it the, oh, don't program? mention it. It was the one of those <laughs> downtown the missions. And uh, I was like, you know, we will try, but it was just too, too tight, and we couldn't do it. And yeah. you know, so oh, and the people were waiting for you to play. No, they weren't waiting. It's just that you know, um, I think there was uh, they it they was were the commitment that yeah. was uh, oh okay because I don't remember who was supposed to be there, and they didn't. You know, I was trying to help out, but you know, it was like yeah, yeah, you know. okay. it's okay. We'll we'll well, we'll we'll straighten that out. Yeah, yeah. next. Time next time it, it won't happen again okay. i know <laughs> okay well, so soon. martha would you present our next guest this is our actually it's not a guest he's one of our co-hosts but we always enjoy hearing about him and having him introduce and that's richard yes connie um today i will present u.s army special forces veteran richard cooks richard is considered another role model a sergeant in the army who fought for his country for over 30 years. He served across the world in places such as Italy, the Hawaiian Islands, and Haiti. During his service, he managed to build a family and launch a career in entertainment, hosting a weekly radio show while representing models and actors. But Sergeant Cook's greatest battle occurred far after he returned from overseas. Out of the blue, an undetected tumor on his heart caused, caused a massive stroke that required emergency surgery. While Co Sergeant Cook survived, he suffered substantial brain damage that led to vision loss, body weakness, and aphasia. This marked the beginning of an enlightening journey to beat the odds and rediscover himself. This year, Richard will officially be entering into the Golden Age Games, 1500 meter power walk, a major accomplishment after suffering three strokes in 2016. Whether you're a veteran, a stroke survivor, or a lover of great American stories, Reading Sergeant Cook's book, which is entitled, I Once Was Whole, will inspire you, inspire you to never stop reaching for your goals. Richard was recently appointed as the new American Veterans, is it American Legion? Or oh, American, American Veterans? American, Veterans? American Veterans Commander. He also has a bestseller on Amazon, I Once Was Whole. Take it away, Richard. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate that. 
And yes, I'm going to be in the Golden Age Games in July. Also, let me know how my aphasia is, because things can be difficult in speaking since the strokes. But let me know. Okay, otherwise, I'll be in the Golden Age Games in July from the 17th to the 26th. And my main area that I'm going to be working on, which I have been training up, is going to be the 1500 meter power walk. Now, the trouble is the strokes in 2016 caused me weakness on my left side, but I have built myself up to be able to do the power walk again. And of course, I'm not looking at any area of achievement just to show that a stroke survivor, anybody who's a military veteran or a civilian who had strokes, they can still do anything to be able to survive and still do things like the power walks. So that's what I'm doing. But also, I'm just going to quickly share if you can see this, because I just found it. Uh, I don't know if you can see this. License. You see what it says indefinite? No. No, we can't see it. Anyway, maybe you'll get a chance to show it. Oh, I see it a little bit. Back it up from the little. Well, yeah, right there. Hold it back a little bit. Hold it back and straighten it a little, it a little bit. bit. Oh, right. bring it forward. It's right there. Way. There you go. Right there. I'm I'm officially retired. All right. Hey. Now, I've, been, I've, been, I've been retired for a while, but they don't make it official until you hit 65. So that's my age now, 65 All years right. old. But anyways, the point is I'm going to do this power walk even though I'm at 65 and they didn't stop me for registering, but uh, even though I'm 65, I'm going to show what can be done at 65 even though uh, others may have a little difficult I show them that what I'm doing, I didn't doing this at my age of 65. So that's what I'll be doing pretty soon. All right. Congratulations. Thank you. All right. And now I... after 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 I've done the Golden Age games, I'll be showing photos of what I was able to do. And and, and at that point, I'll have those next time when we come on the show again. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Taylor, it's on you, baby girl. Yes, ma'am. Miss Wiltshire California pageant, a life-changing experience. Miss Wiltshire California Leadership Institute, formerly known as the Miss Wiltshire California Foundation, are advocates, lifelong learners, and sisters supporting each other to be our best selves. Dr. Alette Cobble Temple, who, after winning both the California and America title in 2015 and 2016, respectively, now serves as a co state coordinator. Born with cerebral palsy, her desire to fight for her rights began during childhood when she refused to go to class until she was allowed to attend a public elementary school in her neighborhood. After winning that battle and graduating from a public high school, she went on to attend Santa Clara University and launch her first and launch the first support group for students with disabilities. Today, as a licensed psychologist with the doctorate or yeah, in psychology under her belt, not only is she a mother and wife, but she is also a full-time professor at John F. Kennedy University and continues to be involved in advocacy for disability rights particularly with the Miss Wheelchair California Leadership Institute. The mission um, of the Institute is to bring to light the many accomplishments of women in wheelchairs. The Miss Wheelchair California Leadership Institute holds a pageant each year in which the winner goes on to compete for the national title. It's safe to say that many people associate the word pageant with one of the widely, widely known beauty contests in which women parade across the stage in high hills and bikini in front of millions of TV viewers. Although there is an advocacy component to those competitions, it doesn't seem to be the main focus. That's where Miss Wheelchair California and likewise Miss Wheelchair America differ. Dr. Cobble Temple explains it like this. We continue to use the terminology of pageant. This is a 
pageant based on modern day leadership principles. Um, our focus is on identifying women who want to be an active role model in their community. The pageant is designed to further develop the advocacy skills of a unique group of leaders, provide a national network for articulate and accomplished women, and to invite the able-bodied community to attain a greater awareness of the potential of all citizens with disabilities. It's about building a generation of leaders within our community. In order to participate, go to Miss Wheelchair California Foundation website, which the Leadership Institute is still using during the transitional period states and following criteria. You must be 21 years of age before the first day of the competition. There's no age cap. You must be or have been in a California resident for at least one full year prior to competition and you must use a wheelchair for 100% of your daily public mobility needs. So how I found out about, oh my goodness. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> I was not expecting that. Okay, so um, initially, how I found out about the Miss Wheelchair uh, pageant, um, I have always wanted to be in pageants, but there were none that I knew of growing up that showcased um, children or women with disabilities. Uh, one day I was doing schoolwork and I needed to shift my focus and I just decided to look up pageants for women with disabilities and the Miss Wheelchair California came up in my Google search. Um, I applied to it and didn't hear anything back um, for about a couple of months and they invited me to be a contestant and I was shocked. <laughs> um, when I got there, it was an amazing experience because there were other women who were doing big things and they didn't let their disability stop them and that's what I wanted to be and that's what I desired to be. And I am grateful for the opportunity because it, it built confidence in me and I developed the boldness and, and confidence in my abilities and not letting, you know, me sitting in a wheelchair stop me from doing anything that I put my mind to. And to this day, um, I still have relationship with these women that have become a part of my village to support me and to encourage me and to, you know, push me to be all that I can be. And so if anyone is interested, definitely reach out to me, reach out to the, um, reach out to the organization and we'll help you as best we can. And it was an honor for me to be there for my girl. She she was always just so precious. And you see them sexy high heel shoes she had on? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. She said she didn't know. Mm. Yeah, <laughs> Even with the shoes, I was like, I don't know about that part, but okay. <laughs> Oh, she was amazing. She's so precious. And she's inspired other individuals, women and men, to use wheelchairs and not let anything stop them, huh, girl? And one other thing we're all proud about with her, she's going for a master's. Yay. Yay. And then she's going to continue her work with, it was Air Force Base as what? The Air Force Base? Hey, hear you. What I want to do? It's, oh, family advocacy officer. Um, so that is the plan. <laughs> well, so you that guys, is what I'm I love you. That is so great. I appreciate that. I appreciate My it. Pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Keep up the good work. You're an inspiration for for so many. Okay. Uh, did you get my email? Uh, not yet. Nope. Okay, I sent it to you, Charles, three minutes ago. But we're going to move right along. Uh, so, here. Well, excuse me? Let's see, I, um, let me check one more time before we do this, just to see. I'm waiting for it. It's, it's not here yet. Okay, well, don't wait. You can always yes. come back. Yeah. Hmm? Okay. Found it? Did you get it? Nope. Oh. Did you push okay. in? Mm-hmm. <laughs> okay, well, sure. go ahead on and go to your right. segment, Charles, as we wind down. All right. Well, this segment is 
hot news, you know, hot, hot, hot news. You know, it's like <laughs> none with a little hot sauce on it, you know, it's just hot and flavorful. Today's hot news is, well, it's Memorial Day. So the first thing I'm going to do is, um, we everyone knows about the shooting in Texas, which is very tragic and very, um, you know, hard to understand why things like this happen. But I'm going to show some pictures of the students that were killed because I think it's, they've been released and they're in public now and we want to give a moment for those families that are really going through this. It's, uh, you know, it's uh, hard to believe how anything, you know, um, could be, it's just, you know, I'm, I'm, we're all tired of, of hearing about these kind of things and, you know, nothing's being done. You know, that's the part that, that uh, is really, uh, let's see, for whatever reason, it's not there, so let's, Stop the share and then do it again. Uh, let's see. One more time. There it is. There we go. Yeah, and, we want to just bow our heads for a few minutes. Yeah. For these precious angels. Say a little prayer. Yeah, this is 16, but I think there was, uh, was it, was it uh, 22, yeah, we wanted to find those. So, yeah, we'll take a minute of uh, silence for, you know, just, in, uh, you know, to memorialize these families, you know, and their children, and so. Yeah, God bless. Okay. okay. Yeah. So that's um, one thing. And now what I'm going to do is share with you a video that I made uh, some years ago and I kind of updated it a little bit. It memorializes our uh, the fallen soldiers and a veteran. So it's a the video is called "The Story Goes On." It's about the, you know, we're constantly sending our soldiers and our, our men and women to war, and uh, you know, a lot of times we don't know why they're out there fighting. But it's called "The Story Goes On," and um, let me do this. Many times that they were sent away to fight and 
Show you play an artist. Thank you. Great song, Charles. Great song. Great, great photos and regarding our Memorial Day. Thank you so much. We're winding down now. It uh, uh I just got those pictures on your recent recent. Let's see here. Yeah, we're gonna end real quick, but we wanted to show show Richard's pictures. We found a couple of pictures of you, Richard. We just want to show them what you were able to do despite okay. your stroke, your workout session. Yes, thank you. Let's see here. This is why we call him a role model. He doesn't let anything stop him. Only a couple, but at least it shows what, what you're capable of doing despite your disability. We got some champions on this show. There's one. There you go. That's how you do your push-ups, Richard. Yeah. <laughs> Man. Yeah. That's the weak side. 
Okay. Is that oh, amazing? Was a weak side. <laughs> Hold up. Let me get the uh, other ones. Oops. Sorry, let me share it. it. Makes a difference. Here's a. Uh, yeah, that's my workout to get the left hand being able to squeeze things yeah. and move my hands. Because mm -hmm. before so those, those... the strokes, they, it couldn't move. Really? And so those push ups, the one you, when you raised up on that one side, that was the weak hand that you raised that's, up on? That's the weak hand. Wow, that's so amazing. God bless you. That's why we call him our role, one of our role models. Congratulations. Keep up the good Thank work. You. Thank mm -hmm. you very much. Show us, we're winding down. we winding down, but I got to show my little animal thing. I got a little one minute. A little clip. Since this, you working out, we got some competition for you right here, Richard. <laughs> oh, <laughs> no, no competition. <laughs> we got some competition for you. Oh, no. <laughs> Let me uh, let me make sure I got it here. Okay, this 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 is uh, this is uh, perfect. Okay, here we go. Let me share this. Yeah, we you got some competition in the workout field. So, <laughs> uh, where is it at? Right there. there. All right. Let me see. I'm gonna make this. That's about. Everybody can see that, right? Right. What is it? A cat doing sit-ups. Oh no! Oh, <laughs> hold on, hold on. I gotta start. Him over. <laughs> Actually, counting, you know. So, a ver, al suelo, eso. Spanish. Y uno, oh, dos, tres, cuatro, cinco, <laughs> seis, <laughs> siete. Dame dos más. Ocho, nueve, diez. Otra más. Once, doce, trece, catorce, quince, dieciséis, diecisiete, dieciocho, diecinueve. 20. Eso. Muy bien, Michi. Venga, Michi, vamos. Only you is fine. <laughs> Only okay, me. Richard, you your next video. I said, video, Richard, you got to speak Spanish. You said that to me. <laughs> you said only I was fine. Oh. <laughs> well, back in February, I had to do, I had to do uh, dips. So I did the dips. And that's what gave me these these medals right here, where it says sports vets. That's because mm -hmm. I did the dips. Okay. Well, we're excited to show that little clip at the end. Those give us a little bit of humor. Okay, so take it away, Taylor. On you, Martha, and then I'll be saying our closing remarks. I would like to remind our viewers and listeners about amazing advertisement rates. We have 20 and 30 second advertisement slots available. Please email info at operationconfidence.org for more information and visit Operation Confidence's website at www.operationconfidence.org resource page for some amazing resources. I would also like to inform our viewers and listeners about Amazon Smell. When making your next purchase on Amazon, please go to Amazon Smell and type in Operation Confidence in the Choose Your Organization donation box. Amazon will make a small donation to Operation Confidence. Also, to get involved in Operation Confidence Tiny Houses Project, visit our website and send us a message on how you would like to be involved. Okay. To our viewers, we would like to also inform you about Operation Confidence's Positive Redirection Team, a group of male and female veterans who are mentors, having overcome similar challenges and situations, uh, be it transitioning back into mainstream society or just in life in general. But to be connected or become a team member, please email us at info at operationconfidence.org. And we are also excited to inform our listeners about Operation Confidence's Combat Boots and Laced Women Veteran Program. It's a mentoring and creative arts group. And our Zoom meetings, we're hoping to get them to start this summer, hopefully the first Saturday of the month. 
And to get involved or to get some more information, please email me directly at martha at operationconfidence.org. Great. Thank you. We want to thank our guests for being on the show today and, and of course, our dynamic co-hosts. And as always, we want to remind our listeners that our goal for the show is to raise awareness about Operation Confidence's mission, which is to provide stable housing with a wide range of supportive services for our veterans, including employment opportunities. So to get involved with our grassroots efforts, please email us at info at operationconfidence.org. And don't forget to check out our website, operationconfidence.org. And we look forward to having you back listening and watching us again next Sunday, always at two o'clock. And don't forget to subscribe to our American Invisible Heroes on YouTube. We have our own YouTube channel. Okay, so we're closing out. Thank you so much for tuning in this Sunday. Happy Memorial Day to everyone. God bless you all. Bye, everybody. <laughs>